Hi Year 12s, it's Mr. Lim here again with another video on Redox about electrolytic cells this time. Alright, so we're we'll going to be learning about electrolytic cells, the parts and the function, the redox reactions, the identifying what actually occurs, so on and so forth, and we're going to be able to draw them hopefully by the end of it. So, um, electrolytic cells, what are they? So galvanic cells in commercial cells convert chemical potential energy into electrical energy. Okay. So that's turning the chemical energy into electrical energy to make it useful in terms of batteries and stuff. Electrolytic cells take electrical energy and then convert it into chemical potential energy, which means they're effectively doing the opposite thing, using electricity to make more reactive, uh, more unstable chemicals. Okay, And it forces a redox reaction to occur via an electric current because uh, that's what electricity is. Okay, so. An electrolytic cell is composed of a couple of different parts, there are three. Number one is a power supply. So it's a source of electrical energy to push electrons in, uh, into one electrode and pull electrons from another electrode. Um, in diagrams, the positive and negative signs are on the end of a power source, so they're usually just labeled so, so positive and negative. Right? However, sometimes they're a collection of lines. Okay? So if they're a collection of lines, then the longer one or the longer end is the positive end. Okay, so if you see something like that, that's the positive end, that's the negative end. Okay, so first of all, you need a power supply, and this would generally go where your voltmeter or ammeter or external circuit would go. Okay, so this would be, be somewhere on the external circuit. Okay, two electrodes. Okay, so this might be a typical diagram of your uh, electrolytic cell. Okay, so what you'll notice is that this is in one beaker, not in two, so you don't have to separate the oxidants and reductants. All right? These are your two electrodes. Let's call this X and Y. This is the positive end. This is the negative end. So one electrode where electrons are drawn from, where oxidation occurs, and uh, it's called the anode, and one electrode where um, electrons are pushed to for where reduction occurs, called the cathode. Okay? Uh, the anode is connected to the positive terminal, so this is, which one's the anode, the X or the Y? The X is the anode, and the Y is the cathode. Um, so, uh, what's the concept here? Anode is where oxidation occurs. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, so you're expecting the electrons to go in that direction, away from that particular electrode. And so the idea is that the electrons are being pulled by the positive charge there. And the negative terminal pushes electrons into the Y electrode, the cathode, for reduction to occur. Okay, so simply from this part of the diagram, you should be able to tell what is the anode, what is the cathode, right? And what the electron flow is. Okay. And then finally, the electrolytic cell is composed of a source of oxidants and reductants. Okay, so here's our electrolytic cell again. Here's our two electrodes. Okay, and here's our battery, or our power source. Um, so, the source of oxidants and reductants is usually in this area here in the solution. Okay, <coughs> so our source of uh, oxidants and reductants is there, and so they will oxidize or reduce on the surface of those electrodes. So it can be a solution of aqueous ions or molecules, or it could be a molten ionic liquid. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that this might be NaCl uh, liquid, whereas this one would be NaClAq. Okay, a solution of aqueous ions, some salt dissolved in water, or you can take that salt and melt it at a very high temperature and you get positive and negative sodium and chloride ions. The electrodes uh, can also be used as a source of oxidants and reductants, otherwise inert electrodes are generally used. Okay, so you can also have like, you know, iron or cobalt or something like that acting as the electrode and as an oxidant and as a reductant. Okay, so those are the three major parts of the cell, the power source, the electrodes, and the source of oxidants and reductants. All right, so sometimes the source of oxidants and reductants can be a mixture of number of oxidants and reductants. So you don't just have one oxidant and one reductant. So for molten substances, so molten substances with inert electrodes, only the positive and negative ions are present as oxidants or reductants. Okay, so if you have uh, your electrolytic cell here, 
Okay, and then you have Na plus and Cl minus ions. Okay, you're only going to have those ions if you've got a molten sodium chloride uh, so, uh, mixture there. Okay, so sodium chloride only, then you'd expect uh, those are the only reactants there. However, if you've got an aqueous solution with inert electrodes, the positive and negative ions can be the oxidants as well, as well as the water itself. So if you've got a solution of it, the water can also act as an oxidant or reductant, right? So here are your equations for it acting as a, uh, in acidic conditions, where water can either gain electrons and go form uh, hydrogen gas, or it can lose electrons and form uh, oxygen gas, okay? And then you could also um, oxidize or reduce uh, the acid ions or acids and bases. Okay, so if you have an electrolysis of acids and bases, you can also see that uh, the OH minus over H plus can also um, react as well. So this here just gives you the idea that when you're asked about electrolytic cells, you've got to identify all of the oxidants and reductants and then work out what's going to occur. Okay, and sometimes it's not just going to be the obvious ones, there's going to be other things there as well. All right, so to determine which of the oxidants and reductants will react, find all of the oxidant and reductants on the standard reduction potential table. Okay, there should be none in the downhill position. All right, remember, we expect a downhill position for spontaneous reactions, but since this is electrical energy driving a chemical change, you're not expecting any spontaneous reactions. You're always expecting in the uphill orientation on the standard reduction potential table, um, your reactants are there. Okay, um, there should be none in the downhill position once you've worked out all your oxidants and reductants, otherwise you're doing it wrong and a spontaneous reaction would occur. Um, find the oxidant and reductant that are closest to each other. So let's say here is your standard reduction potential table. Do, 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 do. Here's a bunch of arrows and they all form into this, 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 this. Okay, so you're looking around and you're saying, okay, well, here's something, here's something, and here's something there. Okay, so you've found all of the oxidants and, that, and the reductants uh, that are in that particular mixture. Okay, so what you do next is you find the oxidant and reductants that are closest to each other. Okay, so this one is the only one on its side, and it's either to that one there, or or that one there. Okay, so it's going to be the one that's closer, so that's that one there, and so therefore you, this is your uh, two reactants that will actually react. Okay, the oxy oxidant and reductant that are closest to each other will be the reactants and the redox reactions. The difference in their E volts, so again that's that value there, and it should be a negative value, considering you need to input energy, not have it spontaneously react, will be the amount of voltage needed to get those things to react at standard conditions. Okay, so you pick the ones, you find them all, first of all, and then you pick the ones that are closest together, not the ones that are further apart, and therefore you will work out um, their, uh, which ones will actually occur. Now when you work out which ones are closest together, don't just go by um, those ones there, all right, because if you just go by that there uh, compared to something else, you've actually got to look at the value that that pulls out, okay? So where that value there is there, and then maybe there's another set somewhere else, and you can't work out what, you have to work out both of their values to work out whether they are, uh, which one will actually occur, right? So let's have a look at some questions about electrolysis. The cell diagram below represents electrolysis of molten calcium bromide. Okay, so immediately we need to start identifying stuff. Molten calcium bromide. Calcium bromide, CaBr2, with inert graphite, graphite electrodes. Okay, so you've got your CaBr2 liquid. Which of the following is correct for the cell? Electrons will flow from the electrode A to electrode B. So we've got to work, look at this diagram and work out what's going on. All right, you've got a battery here, power source. And we need to work out which side is the positive, which side is the negative. Which side is the positive? The one with the um, longer end, that's the negative there. From that, we remember... The anode is connected to the positive, so that's the anode, and that's the cathode, okay? And we remember that the electrons are pulled to the positive terminal and pushed from the negative terminal. So, electrons will flow from electrode A to electrode B, correct. Calcium metal will form at electrode B. Okay, so let's have a think about what's happening at uh, electrode B, the cathode. What's happening at the cathode? Cathode is reduction, okay? If the reduction is occurring, uh, 
can you reduce CA to plus or BR minus? Which one can you reduce? You can only reduce the CA to plus into CA. The BR minus can't be reduced. Okay, so you're expecting calcium ions to um, be reduced into calcium solid, right? And uh, that's where the calcium will be drawn to. Why will the calcium, the positive ions, be drawn to that side? Because you've got the electrons moving into here. So this becomes more negative. And if it becomes more negative, then the positive ions will be attracted to it. So calcium will uh, form at electrode A. That is not true. Okay. And ions will flow to electrode B, which are negative ions. Okay. And ions are negative ions. They will not flow to electrode B. We've already discussed that the positive ions, the cations, will flow to electrode B. <coughs> calcium ions will be oxidized. Okay. So calcium can't be oxidized. It can't go from 2 plus to like 3 plus. So it can only go to calcium uh, solid. So that's not true. And then uh, electrode A is the cathode. Okay, we've already identified that that's the anode from the positive charge on the battery, and so therefore it is A. Okay, one only. Okay, a couple of questions to demonstrate what we mean by um, the, uh, the electrolytic cells and what's inside them. So we imagine electrolytic cell, okay, you might be asked, okay, here's an electrolytic cell, what are the products that are going to be produced from it, okay? Here's my electrolytic cell. Which side's the positive side of the battery? The right-hand side, because I made the longer side there. That makes this the anode, this the cathode. Okay, and let's say I put in some cobalt iodide molten liquid. Cobalt iodide is COI2. How do I know that? Well, I can look at cobalt. Cobalt is 2 plus. Iodide is 1 minus, and therefore that can help me a bit on the um, thing. All right. So, cobalt I2, that is molten liquid, so it's L. So we're going to find all the things, and we already did find it, that was helpful. Cobalt there, iodide there. Are they in the downhill position? No, they are not. They're not supposed to be. Remember, because you, if you had a downhill position, they'd be reacting spontaneously, as opposed to requiring an energy source. So, we would look at, these are the only two um, things. So therefore, they are definitely going to be reacting. How much energy do you need? You would need the difference between those two values, which is like uh, 0.7, no, 0.82, right? 0.82 volts would be needed to run this uh, reaction. The iodide would turn into uh, iodine and probably at high temperatures would be not a solid, might even be a gas. So this is where I, uh, so I2 would be oxidized. So I2 would be forming here and very likely to be a gas form because it's at high temperatures. Why is it at high temperatures? Because you've got a liquid ionic substance. And to get an ionic substance to be liquid, you need to have it at very high temperatures. So your I2 as a gas is probably forming on this thing here, right? And you might have to look up what I2 as a gas is, color is, but you probably won't be asked to do a um, observation on this one. Right. And then what is occurring at the cathode reduction of the cobalt? Now, depending on what the melting point on cobalt is, it might form there or it might form drops of liquid metal and pool at the bottom. So that could be cobalt liquid, liquid cobalt or solid cobalt. Right, um, there. Okay, so that's what would happen in a cobalt iodide molten liquid um, electrolysis cell or electrolysis cell, All right? Or electrolytic cell, I should say. So let's draw another one. What happens now if this instead, this is a nickel two chloride, a nickel two chloride solution. Okay, so here's our two electrodes. Here is your power source. Which side is the anode? Which side is the cathode? This is the anode. This is the cathode. Okay. And it's nickel to chloride aqueous. Okay. So, 
nickel 2 chloride aqueous. So there's a couple of things that are going to be inside this mixture that can possibly oxidize or reduce. Number one is the nickel. Nickel, right? Number two, it's the chlorine. Let's have a look here. Is it that one? No, it's nickel chloride, so therefore it's Cl minus. Okay, what else is here? The water is here, right? Because it's an aqueous solution, we expect lots of water there, so therefore there's a water and there's a water. Okay, so yes, there are other waters like this one here, but that's water with oxygen, and we don't have oxygen being piped into this one there, so that's why we don't count other water ones there. Okay, so, and please note that this one here is not water, that's hydrogen peroxide. It looks like water, but it's not. Okay, so, which one are we going to pick? We are going to pick the two that are closest together. Can you pick these two? Because they seem pretty close together. Well, no, you can't, because both of them are undergoing oxidation, right? You have to pick one oxidant and one reductant, which effectively means one from either side. So you pick the two that are closest together from either side, and that's these two here, right? Um, so therefore, you will have nickel turning to nickel solid at the cathode, right? So that's here, nickel going to nickel solid. Why do I definitely know that this is going to be a nickel solid at this point, right? Because at this temperature, if it's an aqueous solution, it has to be quite cool, definitely cool enough to have nickel solid uh, at that temperature. Right, and then at the other side, so on the left hand side we've got nickel turning into nickel solid, and on the other side we've got water turning into oxygen gas. So what you'll see is gases of oxygen here forming on the anode there. Okay, so you would say a colorless, oh sorry, a green solution, that's the nickel solution, is electrolyzed, and you would see a clear colorless odorless gas coming from the anode or the right uh, electrode, and the uh, left electrode would be getting a gray coating on it, or it would be getting heavier. All right, so those are the concepts that you need to know about electrolytic uh, cells. We're gonna be going through more in class and in the next couple of lessons, but that's it for today. Have fun.